Hello, uh, this is meeting 11 of the Visual Tools group. Uh, we are a few friends here and we will be discussing a little bit of the state of the tooling ecosystem, or at least some part of it. And um, uh, we will begin by introducing ourselves, just telling a little bit about who we are and what we're interested in. And then uh, we'll have a short presentation, uh, kind of trying to provoke a discussion. And then today, mostly, mostly have a discussion of, of how we possibly create uh, some conventions between tools. And the topic uh, we are trying to address is learning resources. We are trying to talk about how we could create resources, like, for example, the materials for the coming data science course that would be copy paste friendly in different tools. So, you know, we will have some uh, uh, notes of a talk or a tutorial or something, and it would hopefully just work in different tools. And it is very relevant at the moment because actually there are new tools which are emerging these days. And maybe Adrian will tell something about uh, Adrian's uh, adventures, in, and then uh, maybe Ryan will mention something about what will be presented next week, and and so on. So um, we we are in this exciting time, and this think, thinking is kind of needed. And hello, George. Thank you for joining us. Um, so maybe we should begin by short intros. Just tell a bit about ourselves. So maybe I'll begin. Um, I'm Daniel. I. Uh, I'm involved in community building and I do statistics mostly. And um, uh, uh, these days I'm I'm kind of <laughs> uh, kind of bothered about these tooling questions. Uh, and so maybe I'll share later just a bit of my thought. Um, Adham, would you maybe tell about yourself? All right, uh, I'm Adham. I'm a data analyst. At the moment, I'm working with R and Shiny, building uh, web applications for uh, displaying data, such as like a chorp, a chorp of maps. And I'm interested in Clojure because I am falling more and more in love with functional languages, and Clojure seems like a really great language. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, Ryan, maybe. So my name is Ryan Robitai. Uh, a longtime career uh, data engineer who, at some point, got more heavily into data viz and dashboarding and all that. Um, spent been all been used every tool set, you know, Tableau, SQL Server, reporting services, you know, made stuff in Python and JavaScript, raw. Um, but lately, has been you know, past few years, been obsessed with kind of closure and uh, bringing this kind of direct manipula manipulation. Um, I don't know, like the dream data viz tool for me, which is what inspired me to build uh, Rabbit, which I'm talking about uh, next week. But yeah, happy to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks. And maybe George, is it OK? Hello, I'm George. And um, I work in the financial industry. And I'm a manager. And I built uh, REST APIs for the last decade. And two weeks ago, I switched to data engineering. And so from Java Spring to Clojure in the past, now it's Scala and Airflow and Snowflake and all these other cool tools that I'm just learning now. And uh, I did stuff for Clojure in the past, uh, and I'm hoping to get caught back up to speed and use it in this new world. Uh, I'll go with Adrian. Hi, I'm Adrian. and. Um... I'm mostly interested in how you can use visual tools for just to improve um, general purpose programming. Yeah, uh, by the way, hello, Max. Uh, thank you for joining. We were just introducing ourselves. Um, Kira, if you're there, maybe uh, Kira had a phone call, so maybe uh, we'll come back in a moment. Uh, Max, would you tell a bit about yourself? Is it okay? Oh, no, Mike. Yeah. So anyway, hello, Max. Nice to meet. And uh, Christopher will probably join us in a moment. So maybe we will begin and uh, just uh, chat a bit about our situation. And 
uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share the screen and um, we, we will kind of uh, have really, really the shortest and most boring uh, presentation possible so that we could mostly have a discussion. And uh, yeah, so, so maybe, uh, yeah, here are, uh, uh, here are some notes. So I share the screen. Yeah, so, so uh, what we're discussing now is something we have been talking about a few times in the past. And uh, we have had some progress and some a few experiments that did teach us something. And we want to think about where we are today. So uh, what is the problem we're discussing? We are talking about a situation where many, many amazing visual tools are emerging. So next week we'll have the data rabbits. And also these days there is this excitement around Calva notebooks and uh, connecting that with Portal and other many other uh, tools which are emer emerging, like Clerk, for example, that probably many of you know. And uh, these tools are not copy paste friendly. What does it mean? It means that if somebody is writing some notes, like a tutorial maybe, uh, in say Clerk, this amazing notebook tool, then they would be creating a beautiful tutorial and creating different visual things like this, uh, you know, like plots and images and such. And then they would like to just use that in another tool like Portal. And then they cannot just copy the code and have it working because each tool has its own way of saying this should be considered a plot that is an image you should show it as an image each tool has its own little conventions which would make it precise how things should be displayed so one cannot copy paste code across visual tools does it make sense that there is a problem yeah, or maybe maybe any comments about this statement of a problem before we continue, maybe. Yeah, so I think it is clear, uh, because at least for a few of you who have been playing with different tools. And then today, these days, we are actually thinking about a few kinds of learning resources. So there is a coming data science course and, uh, you know, participants in the course will be creating all kinds of little projects and exercises and tutorials and such. And there is the cookbook project by Kira that maybe Kira will mention later. And in general, people are creating many tutorials and all these things are happening today. And we should be asking, will there be, will, will we have any way to create those resources so that they would be copy paste friendly with the future tools, with the tools which are emerging today. And so that's the problem. And what, you know, after a few experiences in the last few months, uh, uh, today we'll try to propose something and discuss it. And the idea of today would be to suggest some way to be precise, some conventions that would allow to say, what kind of way a given value should be displayed. And we would like to discuss some sensible defaults and also an ability to overwrite them by the user. So for example, if we have an image, we would like to consider that an image by default. Or if we have a plot of the Vega specification, we should be able to say, this is Vega. Right, or that is hiccup, this is markdown, all these visual formats. And so we want to suggest a certain way to do that. And we want to discuss this way with tool makers and actually adapt it and do what, whatever changes needed to actually make it make sense for as many tools as we could, if we could, right? And then, you know, the next short term step would be to create a very boring tool, a small tool that will just allow to display these things by convention so that we will be able to start teaching our uh, uh, 
uh, data science course and other things so that we will be able to begin create materials and then later in the longer term we would like to just encourage as many tooling projects as we could to uh, use these conventions as a device so for example if the course materials say here is a vega plot then we would like hopefully uh, other tooling projects to uh, use that as an advice and actually plot that thing as a vega plot so that is the, the proposed solution that we would like to discuss today and maybe we will realize it is absurd maybe we will realize it is just too complicated but maybe we could have some pragmatic choices that would make it doable and what i, I wish to present very briefly is what that boring tool could be for the short term and what those suggested conventions could be uh, so that we will have something concrete to discuss and then hopefully change so that you know you could affect it by by your um your experience and your opinion and then mostly discuss it so that's the plan just have these little demos and discuss them but maybe uh, maybe it's a good time to stop and think for a moment oh hello christopher yeah so uh, so nice um uh, you haven't missed so much but and i think you know what we are discussing uh, we this trouble of trying to create resources which are copy paste friendly and um uh, I'll just add that in the last few weeks, I've been playing with Oz, Oz, this project by Christopher, uh, which is, has been maybe the, the uh, for a few years, the main uh, notebook-like tool a few of us have been using. And, and I just realized that Oz is more than I could imagine. So that is why I couldn't connect it as I hoped to, but, but maybe that is a very concrete hope for the, the near future. And, uh yeah so any comments so far any thoughts about this situation this hope for copy paste friendliness and so I, I, um so, sorry chris you're, you're saying something my bad oh i just said i love it <laughs> nice uh i just have a quick question so I'm, so I'm new to the group right and um i'm not familiar with some of the other tools you're talking about i mean i've used some of them but it seems to be for the copy and paste problem that a lot of these tools require like wrapper code or boilerplate to be able to display certain things in certain ways. I mean, is that pretty much the crux of that problem? Daniel? Yes, exactly. Yes. Some boilerplate, some metadata, some way, some notation to say, this is Vega, this is Hiccup, this is Markdown. And and maybe what we could do, maybe after I present some suggestion, maybe Christopher will could show uh, a bit of how Oz does it, uh, if you like, and we could see the variations that of that boilerplate, right? And uh, yeah, but anyway, let us see something very simple and very concrete. And uh, so, uh, so first, uh, we would like to talk about a boring tool, about something we could hope for in the short term. Uh, so. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll just restart the record and share the screen. Sorry to interject, by the way. <laughs> My bad. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, no, I, I, I interrupted your, your presentation. Oh, no, no, that is needed. That is very much needed. We want that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I'll share the screen again. And uh, yeah, and, and so you see what we have here is like a little namespace and, and this namespace follows the, this uh, tradition that some of us call namespace as a notebook. Well, maybe Oz is the prototype of all solutions, but there are actually a few other projects that do that. And the idea is that the regular closure namespace can serve as the source for a notebook. And, and here, you know, it is, uh, written to work with a project called Clay, which is just a little tool we have been playing with in the last few months. And we just experienced it for a moment, just to, to have, you know, a concrete, concrete experience to discuss. And I think, uh, oh yeah, it's 
still loading requirements and such. And uh, yeah, so um, so you see, we have many values here, and we have some browser view, and and we actually uh, want to uh, present different things in the browser. And the way Clay works is is uh, that when one um, uh, evaluates something, uh, it should be shown in the browser. So now, uh, sorry for the delay, but uh, now we, for example, evaluated this uh, uh, plot of the eCharts library and got the plot in the browser, and we could uh, evaluate something of the, uh, this uh, Cytoscape uh, library for networks. And you see it is this very boring experience that uh, follows uh, something which is obviously, obviously in OS also, just this ability to send something, to send a visual value to the browser. And, you know, you see, we have a certain way here saying what kind of way a thing should be displayed. And we'll discuss that just a little later. Uh, but the need is to just display values visually in the browser. That is maybe the first need, just display a value. The second need is to render a whole namespace as a notebook, right? So uh, here I'm calling some function that would render the namespace and it is taking some time to evaluate, but eventually we get this uh, uh, notebook, which is the rendering of this namespace. And um, so what I suggest is that for our learning resources, these, these are the two basic needs. And after we come up with some a proposed convention, it should be easy to satisfy those needs with the convert the convention that we hopefully uh, converge to together, right? And so that is the short-term uh, plan to decide how to make that boilerplate uh, acceptable to different tools, and then create a boring tool that does it, that makes it work. And now let us discuss what could be the convention. What could be a way to say how things should be rendered? And so maybe I'll now uh, open another project, which is. Um, Can I ask you uh, one question, Daniel? Yeah. I, I missed it. How did you get it to display the entire notebook instead of just a single form by right. evaluating it? Are you just saving the file there, or are you oh, thank evaluating you. the whole namespace? Yeah, yeah. I had an editor specific key binding. Okay. Okay. that uh, in this case emacs that actually called a closure function and did pass the file name to the function so something was happening and i didn't even mention it was happening right thank you thank you for that yeah and so all these choices they are tool specific and i'm just trying to imagine what would be the most basic tool we need in the short term right and yeah and uh so so maybe uh, we, we'll go to some some examples of of this kindly library, and this kindly library is just a tiny, really, really small library with basically no dependencies that tries to offer ways to handle that boilerplate, to handle the question of how sorry, of what kind of way a thing should be displayed, right? And, and we'll try to make sense of it. It is a new draft of the, a new version. And the hope is to just use it as a way to provoke a discussion. And I would love to replace it with whatever we come up with together, if we could uh, converge to something that we could accept, you know, uh, maybe a, at least a few of us. And so uh, the idea is that um yeah we don't need that anymore uh, so the idea is that um to decide how a given thing should be rendered we may need to look into the value of that thing but possibly also to the code that generated it and that is already maybe controversial because not all tools are looking into the actual code as a way to decide how to render something. 
But you see, let, let us uh, kind of be concrete and imagine, you know, that uh, uh, the user is writing some piece of code, like uh, maybe creating uh, some hiccup uh, form, right? And then uh, they would like to say, this is hiccup. So uh, it is not obvious that they need to, for example, in OZ, it would be hiccup by default. And maybe we would argue that it should be like that in all tools, or maybe at least in our suggested convention, right? But let us say that our tool doesn't know it is hiccup. So the user needs to say, this is hiccup. So they could uh, say something like that, like call a function over it to say, I'm uh, adapting this value. I'm actually attaching some metadata to this value to say it is hiccup. But in some tools, there is some metadata notation at the code level that would say something like that. And I'm writing it here as an option because when we were trying different ways of expression, actually users were asking for something like that. They, that, you know, they found convenient. So I'm proposing at the moment to say, yes, the code, the code that creates the value is something that could affect the decision of the kind. Well, the kind is the answer, the, the kind of way uh, we should be displaying something. So the proposal is to, yeah, maybe just let us make it more interesting to kind of be clear. It could be like uh, evaluating something, right? So the proposal is to have a function that would get both the code, which is in this case, it is this thing, And the value, which is in this case, uh, page one, three. And our function would advise the tool how to treat that, that context of code and value. So in this case, we could ask for something like uh, advice for, for this uh, piece of code and these, this value. And, uh, and then the advice would return something like um, a whole data structure that also specifies not only the code and the value, but also the kind to be something like kind pickup. Right? So the advice function would add the missing information and say, this should be considered hiccup. And so that's the proposal. The proposal is to have some general advice function that would be an advice for different tooling projects and have it give the answer. And the idea is to make it uh, configurable so that we would be able to come up with certain default behavior for our teaching resources, but maybe another, another project would come up with its own defaults for its users if, if the, it seems to be needed, right? But that's the main entry point for the API we are suggesting. So is it making sense uh, at the moment? I, maybe it is a bit abstract. Maybe it is obvious to the people creating tools, but not to everybody. I'm, I'm not sure. Should I? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll comment uh, about what I'm If I imagining. can ask one quick question. How yeah. do you see advice being, or yeah, advice being used? Is that is that something that yeah. uh, that would happen kind of behind the scenes, or would this be kind of a core part of the um, the the usage pattern? Yeah. So the the user would typically not care about right. advice, but the person in inventing a new tool, like maybe let us mention Portal. So the tool called, called Portal uh, would actually look into the code and value and ask, call this advice function and see, oh, the, and they would learn the user wanted something to be considered as hiccup and they would 
maybe respect that and present that value as hiccup. So a portal in the source code would hopefully call advice somewhere, or at least would be extensible enough so that we could write an adapter to portal that would rely on the advice. And what I'm hoping is that we could make it friendly enough, easy enough, so that tools would be happy to use that advice uh, without breaking any behavior if there isn't any kind specification. And, and uh, that's the proposal. And, and if, if you wish, we could dive into details in a moment. But is the proposal uh, making sense so far? Yeah, could we, yeah really. sorry. Could, could we imagine that we as a group, or at least a few of us, could invent the semantics of this advice function so that it would make sense for different tools? Sorry, sorry for stopping you. No, no, this seems, seems reasonable. I just, uh, so again, um, new, you know, so this may be an ignorant question, but <clears throat> so something I struggled with with Rabbit for a long time was this kind of thing, right? I didn't want weird proprietary wrappers and stuff because it kind of takes away from like the playground aspect of closure. Um, so I settled on basically evaluating the piece and looking at the data type that came out of it and then generating the renderer based on that, right? Be it a data structure or hiccup or uh, Vega, JavaScript, whatever. Um, which I, th I think is the most cleanest way to do it from a user space perspective, but obviously there's complications there. Um, again, I'm new to, to this whole thing. So uh, apologies if this is like out of left field. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's just kind of where I, where I come from. Um, on this because I struggled with this for a long time. I didn't want to have any like any magic that was kind of outside of the base language, right? I didn't want to create like a rabbit DSL to draw stuff, you know? Um, I just wanted to make the data structures and the outputs like, you know, show for themselves. Um, so that's kind of I, I don't know in, in your API idea how that would even be implemented. Obviously, or you'd have to like cache the output and then look at it and run your run your advice in the background, right? Since advice is nothing that's user space there would be something that the system does to generate you know whatever the render portal is um if that's what you're implying then my bad um but just just yeah. my two on that. yeah yeah because like, yeah. I, I i struggled with this for a long time i had lots of wrappers i had hinting i had comment hinting i had metadata hinting and it just all at the end of the day building stuff just felt really weird it felt like i would be forcing people to do this like like esoteric thing instead of just hey pick up any closure book and write closure and it should run, it should work. Right. Um, anyways, that's just my immediate reaction from this after staring at the stuff for way too long. So. Yeah. So uh, what you're saying, Ryan, is that there is some inference, automatic inference taking place that knows how a hiccup value looks and just knows how to treat it as hiccup, for example. Yeah. I mean, hiccup, hiccups up, uh, an exception because hiccups, you know, obviously a vector that starts with a certain keyword, right? That's pretty easy to pick up. Otherwise, it would just render as a vector. Um, the stuff that I did was mostly rendering data types, but since the visualization layer of Rabbit is essentially closure script, it's really easy to say, hey, this is a compiled JavaScript object, right? Show it as that. And anything else is basically a data type, a row set, a map, a vector, a string, you know, what have you. Um, so maybe I'm cheating a little bit in that case, right? Because I take I take the REPL values from Clojure, bring them to Clojure script, and then visualize them in that layer. Um, so yeah, so maybe I'm cheating a little bit, but I, I tried to stay away from like, hey, let's have a have a bunch of like renderer libraries, right, that are very specific to each thing, because I I didn't feel that was like, extensible enough, you know. Like if yeah. I want to if I want to generate like a, a Vega light graph with Oz, like I just write the function like you'd see in the tutorial, right? And it just renders because the UI says, oh, this is a JavaScript, you know, whatever, boom, like here it is. Um, so how does it recognize a Vega specification, for example, and knows that is Vega? Uh, it doesn't have to, because it's evaluating the Vega specification inside Oz, inside a function that gets bootstrapped. So the output is just the compiled JavaScript of the graph, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to introspect the code. It can just see, hey, I'm going to evaluate this thing. 
here's my output. And then I, I look at the output and get the data type, right? And then send it to a particular renderer. Um, people can change the renderer. Like if, I, if it's a map and I'm drawing a map, I can change it to text or whatever. Um, but again, if this is, if this is uh, not, not where you're going with this, apologies. But um, I, I just thought that was the cleanest way to do this. And I'm sure there's downfalls there, you know? Uh, there certainly is on the closure side with different readers and whatnot. Um, but in terms of like using CLJS as my visualization layer, like I found it pretty nice. Like I have a visualization type that's basically auto, which is like whatever this is, just show it in the nicest way. Um, and there's no rabbit code, there's no boilerplate, there's none of that. Cause I'm 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 looking at the values, right? Not the code, not the, you know, not the wrapper. Um again, I didn't mean this to be a rabbit like grandstanding. I know it's next week, so. No, this is actually really helpful because part of what we're going to do here is like we want to uh daniel said kept the very uh unenviable task of like trying to make sure that all these different pieces of the visualization and kind of data science ecosystem are able to play nicely together so that sure. um so that someone who starts out with clay can either take their work to rabbit or to oz or to portal or to whatever and um and they're not having to think a bunch about like I mean, in a way, it's very much kind of what you're saying, um, which is like, I don't want people to have to like learn this particular way of doing things to use my tool. I want them just to be able to kind of write closure and have it do the right thing. And I think that is, I think that is at least to some approximation, kind of uh, uh, a very overlapping goal, at least, um, which is that right? Like we want we want a particular vocabulary so that for all the for all the educational resources that are being put together, we want it to be so that like. This isn't like for this specific tool. This is something that you can port around and use in different tools. And to the extent that we can do that, um, we're just gonna. Uh, I mean, the, the the goal is that that um, just makes it that much easier for everyone to like come into the closure ecosystem, right? So, so now this is exactly the kind of feedback that we need because we're thinking about, yeah, we're thinking it, it's kind of a hard problem, right? Like we're thinking about how all these different tools think about things and and like the subtle differences and like well in this context like right like in your context and i don't understand maybe you could actually explain a little bit more about this so like in your context like i looked at data rabbit it looks really cool by the way but like you, you have to refresh my memory so like what are you starting with you're starting with a regular like clj uh um file or you know um um uh namespace and then it's sending stuff to um, to a CLJS CLJS world, or what's? Can you like just describe a little? Because I'm curious about like right. You're talking about you just do Oz, and then it just does the Oz thing. So is everything yeah. happening in ClojureScript? Uh, no, no. There's a there are certain blocks that execute um, on just the Closure REPL side, right? And there are certain okay. blocks that execute only on the CLJS side. But okay. in, re in in executing the Closure version, right? It has to come to CLJS to render. So I can write a function in closure on the REPL that outputs a, uh, a hiccup vector and it'll render as a hiccup vector on the screen because the, the UI just says, oh shit, this is a hiccup vector. You know, this is this yeah, is hiccup. Okay. Um, so yeah. like I said, I'm kind of cheating a little bit there because I use that as the pipeline. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're totally right. It's like, I, I didn't want people to learn like some library specific language to get stuff to work and then be like, well, I'm confused, you know, what is closure and what is this library and what is whatever, right? Um, like, you know, yeah, yeah. Cause because then the problem with that is you end up building like these these esoteric readers for all these different things that want to treat the canvas a different way. And it's like, man, how can we do it the most generic way? Right. It was it was a real tough thing to figure out. And I don't know if I fully solved it, but um anyways, yeah, like I said, the, the rabbit thing is next week. I would love to give like a, a, a two-minute example of what I mean. Um, but I don't I don't want to take away Daniel's huh. idea. Yeah, so, so actually, we have time. Uh, we have like 15 minutes to the official time. And maybe what we could do is spend a few minutes on each of the tools. You know, there are a few tool makers here. So maybe you would like to present a little bit uh, and uh, just to, to give a concrete idea. And maybe uh, before doing that, I'll, I'll kind of provoke the discussion with a few examples that would kind of see the trouble. Um, so, um, um, and then we could maybe dive in into two or three tools uh, which are relevant. So, um, if if I can ask, um, how would you maybe just as a motivating example, uh, if you do present Ryan, or, or you just tell us, 
with the Oz case in particular, I mean, it's easy to think like, okay, if I just have some hiccup, like it's easy to see what happens there, right? Like it's getting sent. And then as you said, you're doing some, you're looking at the shape of it. Does this look like hiccup? If it does, then you're under a hiccup, right? So um, uh, if you were doing an Oz visualization, like what would you send then? Are you sending like, uh, colon vega you know keyword vega and then kind of like kind of like the oz syntax or are you um so you're just keying off of that first keyword entry or are you like calling it like you would if you were creating a uh a reagent component like using the closure script side of oz yeah i'm currently using the closure closure script side of oz um if i was yeah, using okay. the, the closure version like i'm assuming you have the option there to like spit out a png or something right and i'd have to build I have to say, hey, like, you know, go show this, you know, in this other, uh, you know, image tag or whatever. Um, but yeah, with, with, with Oz, I'm, I'm using the uh, closure script version. Yeah. And so like the code you would literally write then would be what? Would be just the Vega light spec inside the Oz function. Um, okay. I can, I can show you in a second if, if we do this. Okay, if we cool. Do this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just based like, like I wanted to be able to go to the GitHub page, cut and paste a tutorial and have it right. like 99.9% .9 work. Cause otherwise, especially if you're learning something, you're like, oh, I'm lost. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe uh, really briefly, let us mention a few examples we, we could care about. So one is, yeah. So, sorry, I, I'm what, uh, the use cases I'm talking about are mostly on the closure backend side, where somebody is working with data and creating something and willing to see, to visualize. So one thing could be an image. So an image could be a Java object of the buffered image class, and they would just want to see that image. Another thing could be closure data structure, like a vector or a map or something nested, where inside you may have some values that deserve some special view, like buffered image objects. So imagine a vector with a few buffer, buffered image objects. How would that be rendered? Right? Another example is a specification of Vega or, or eCharts or some, some JavaScript JSON friendly library. Another example is hiccup. Another example is hiccup where inside the hiccup we have values that uh, comply with another specification like Vega. So what happens if we have Vega inside hiccup? Right? And another example is a specific library. For example, this famous uh, TechML dataset library that has some table like data structure and we want to see that table and then uh, we could do that in different ways one could be to have it printed and render the printed data set as markdown it turns out that it comes up beautifully so that is one option right so how would we express that here is an additional library it has a certain type we can recognize if we depend on that library and we want that type to be printed as a string and then considered as markdown. So I'm just uh, throwing up examples so that we have something concrete. And then maybe maybe I should stop and we could maybe have a discussion of Rabbit and Oz and maybe Adrian, one of the things you're creating, if you wish, uh, if you find them relevant. Uh, right. um, so should we dive into Rabbit for a little bit? Uh, sure. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Um, let me just switch to sharing here. I'll try to hit some of the stuff you mentioned as fast as I can. Um, okay. Can you can everyone see the uh, the screen here? Yes. Yeah. So I have a bunch of simple data types here, right? So I mean, this is obviously a string. Um, this is you know a row set of vector maps. Um, you see, it's it's rendering it as out auto it's trying to think well what is this and how can i render it but i could easily say you know show it as text um show it as a, a nested map um but auto is you know a, a v table row set right 
um, you know, float, integer. This is a nested map, right? With different keys and vectors. And uh, I can even do some cool stuff with this. Be like, you know, let's say I just wanted this, this numbers value. I could literally just drag this index out to here and get a get in and get the numbers. So like we're digging in and getting get ins from maps. This is just some hiccup, you know, I just cut and paste it's Buffy the Vampire pick, which could be anything, you know, it doesn't really, doesn't, there's no tagging, there's no specifications. It's just, this is hiccup doing a thing. And the UI says, oh, okay, this is, this is a, this is a render object. I'll render it. Um, if I wanted to render this as text and you can see it, well, obviously it's just a vector. So that's a crappy example, but so, so as far as basic, what's that? It's an image buffer. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, I got, I got to remember that for other demos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, simple data types, you know, all, all cool. Um, some of the stuff that Daniel mentioned. Um, so that was all CLJS, right? So this is actually a mixture, right? This is doing some. Um, so I have this other REPL. Sorry, before you go on real quick, can I ask, yeah. how, did, how do you decide by default whether to show that kind of row set table mode versus... Um, the kind of nested cards view. Yeah, I mean, basically just looks at, like I said, it looks at the output. And for, I had this like arbitrary, like fake data type called row set, which is basically just um, a vector of uniform maps, right? Because it gets yeah. used, it gets used so much in building data viz on the JavaScript, yeah. on the JavaScript yeah. side, you know? Um, uh, Cause you really can't use like a, like a record or anything, you know, it basically ends up being this, which is kind of wasteful, but this comes up so much. I'm like, okay, let's show this as like a data set, right? Um, cause I do a lot of SQL and stuff and like, you know, I deal with this a lot. Yeah, so yeah. I just made it like this arbitrary type, but yeah, it just looks at the output and says, Hey, what is this? And then it assigns it, you know, one of these output types, you know, with the auto, but you can always just override it and say, well, you know, show this as text or yeah, show yeah. this as map boxes, which is kind of that like recursive, boxes, yeah. um, uh, which is a little yeah. confusing, but it's nice. It's nice for like picking out, you know, values instead of having to write get ins all the time. Um, yeah, and, and so just to be really clear, though, so like you're, you're literally just scanning through the data structure and what checking if like each entry has the same keys or that the values are and or that the values are flat, that they're not like more nested structures or is it something kind of like that? Yeah, in this case, I'm pretty sure the function that checks for row set is basically looking for the same keys and X amount of rows okay. and making sure they're not nested because otherwise it won't render. Or okay. if, it, if it does see nested, it'll just it'll just use this like map recursive view, you know? Okay, um, okay. And yeah, so I tried to render it um, and you can't render it because it's, you know, it's just a map. Um, so, you know, that blows up. Okay, yeah, but, cool, uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, so yeah, so uh, the Dan what Daniel was saying, so this is another one that's basically mixed, right? So this is a closure REPL um, doing some uh, Scilodge stuff, uh, the Titanic stuff off of um, off of the, the GitHub page. Yeah, it's kind of cramped, I should make this one a little bigger. But basically it's, it's, rendering, it's rendering the output of that, you know, all the training set for Titanic test trained and printing it just like it would on a REPL, you know, printing out the data sets um, just like it would, you know, if you were typing in a REPL, which is cool. It's executing all this in one pass, but I can, I can look at each piece individually. So, so this is the printed out data set of those training sets, but I can also say, but this is just the, this is the, the text, right? I could, this is the REPL output. I can also say, well, I have a data set here because I used, where is it? Um, I used MapSeq Reader, right? To show Titanic test. Well, that seems to be right here. And I can say, well, this is the output I want to see. Let's let's look at this auto. And if I send this to auto, it says, oh, well, this is a uniform set of maps, right? So it's a row set. So I can show this as a row set, even though the REPL, you know, wouldn't be able to do this. This is just basically pushing it to CLJS and rendering it in CLJS, which is which is kind of neat. Um, taking that one step further, um, here's an encanter, uh, just a simple encanter, again, the GitHub demo, right? Um, renders a randomized, uh, you know, sine wave and bar chart. But here I'm taking values from closure script and sending them in to the REPL code just to, you know, reevaluate it, um, which is, which is, you know, kind of neat, kind of like crossing the streams there. Um, no, it's very cool. Uh, yeah, cool. I mean, doing, doing again, very simple. There's nothing funky in here in terms of rabbit with the exception of like these, um, you know, data set ML data sets, I can't print them the way you did in a REPL. I have to like actually get the, you know, sequence of maps. 
Um, so my main question here is just like, how do you, are, are you, is there just a toggle or a control that says like this code is, this code is um, uh, closure versus closure script? Like how do you actually switch modes there? Yeah, so for, uh, where's my thing here? So for these blocks, right, I have like a, so this is a closure script block, uh, right? One, okay. 10, eight, seven, nine. And then this is a closure block, which by default okay, uses, I see. The, uses the built-in, uses the built-in REPL uh, that Rabbit runs with, you know, it's running, you know, one ten. But okay. what's cool about that is like for this Encanter uh, REPL, I'm actually using a different REPL because you have to use an older version of closure apparently. So if I go here and say, hey, uh, it's over. So it was 110.3. And if I, you know, go and put this, connect to this custom REPL at 42.999, it should change to, yeah, closure 1.9 because huh. that's, the, that's the one that has all the Encanter stuff loaded in. It's not, it's not baked into the jar, right? Um, but yeah, so just the, the, last, the last piece of that little carry over here, like here is, I believe this is, I, again, standard off the docks, um, stock stuff for a tech ML data set, right? You know, um, it hits it hits a hits a CSV file, gets it gets the data set, prints it out. You know, I have access to the REPL output, but I also can create again map seek reader, give me the actual data structure, and then I take that data structure, I can render it here, and also send it. If you see on the right here, send it to the right here to another block which now makes it a closure script object, which now means that I can throw it into whatever viz library and do various things with it. You know, so here I'm clicking on the bar and changing the value, you know, just, just the whole thing, trying to make the, the flow between the two platforms like seamless enough to where I just want to get work done, right? I don't yeah, want to have to work. That's really cool. Out. Yeah, anyways. Uh, I'll just ask one more question. I'm asking all the questions. No, no, uh, no. One more question though. How, how do you, so it's, Let's see, what am I actually asking you? Go back to, you had the one big chunk of code. I wasn't actually sure what it was producing, but then you had a few, um, it was the closure. Uh, it was a closure block, I guess. And then you had a few different um, output, like at the top, it showed like output one, output two, output three, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Are you select, let, let me know if you don't know what I'm talking about, but are, are you selecting um, which blocks within the, I mean, <laughs> which blocks within that chunk of code are actually getting turned into quote unquote outputs or is like every block an output Does that um, make sense? yeah pretty much every block's an output but i choose which ones propagate through the blocks right like so for closure script it's kind of it runs kind of like a do block right we do a bunch of stuff and then the last thing is kind of what i evaluate because in closure script there's no point for me having like three or four different outputs in one block you know um or at least for my uses so for a, a repl block let me just do a fresh closure one here and stop me daniel if i'm going over so for a, a REPL block, so we have a single value, right? It spits out, you know, what it is. So if I go here and I say, all right, well, let's just do um, do some math. And then I'll do, you know, uh, string. And then maybe just for the hell of it, we'll do uh, B2, whatever, right? So when I run it, it by default shows me the last thing here. But if you see up here, okay. I have access to all those outputs, yeah, right? Okay, okay, yeah. So, so yeah. So if I, yeah, if I change this, I can say, all right, I want to put the code here. I, I want to see my twelve um, there, and I want to see this map there. And then, let's say I want to propagate this data out, and like this is what I really want, right? So I'm going to say this map here. I want to take this guy and send it downstream to this block so now if i take this block and i drag it out i should get right that map and then i say from this map i just want this key and and you you can you can see how you know with a language like this with a, something expressive as this like how how deep that kind of goes you know um but yeah so just kind of i just thought it was kind of relevant to the, the the copy paste boilerplate discussion because like i tried so hard to like not not have that um so just real quick before before Daniel cuts me off, let me uh, let me just go to the the Vega example. <laughs> I'm just kidding with it, man. Um, let me just go to the Vega example. This is kind of slow because it's running in my. This is like a dev, my reframed dev with 10x and all that stuff running. Um, this is a pretty complicated example that I'm making a video on, so forgive me. Um, so this, so these are Nevo charts, but this is a Vega map um, or Oz map, which. Uh, 
I'm pretty excited about because I, I just recently got into the layers. And just to show you what this looks like here. Oh, it's so slow. Yeah, so it's literally a recon box wrapped around just Oscor Vega Light. No, yeah, no hint, no hinting, nothing. Just um, regular. I mean, you could cut and paste this in a closure script, and if you had these libs, like it should just work. You know, um, yeah. I'm calling, you're calling Adams. Uh, you can see here. Uh, yeah, in all these some of these lines are Adams. Some of these are like actual uh, explicit calls. Um, yeah, just uh, I tried to not have anything funky. What is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so again, the thing that it's displaying in the final box is just the last one, unless you pick a different one or something, right? Yeah, well, up, this is a closure script box, so it's kind of different. So up here, okay. these are actually, uh, if you see the highlighting on the left there, these are actually the, the inputs, inputs to this, yeah. okay. which, which, come, which come from closure because it's a SQL query to a ClickHouse database, right? So this is yeah, like, yeah. this is the, the districts and this is, uh, you know, the incident, the red blocks. Um, this is a this is an atom I'm deref'ing just there as like context, um, and this is the render objects you know object recon box box and then uh, yeah Oscor Vega Light so this is the compiled object that it's actually rendering the box, and then this is just bangs this is just like I'm I'm mutating an atom somewhere so I just show it up here, um, mm -hmm. but yeah nothing 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 hinted nothing uh, just trying to be as clean as possible while still keep this like kind of canvas thing going. So yeah, cool. But hopefully that explain like helps explain what I was talking about a little bit. Um, but again, I'm gonna Sorry, go through all. I guess one more question: How are you actually getting like those inputs into the code? Like, if you're, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, two ways, right? So I can use regular um, regular atoms, right? Because basically, if I'm running this, if okay. I'm running this, if I'm running this with no namespace. Um, it's basically like like cojs.user, whatever the default one is, right? I can put a namespace here and it'll work, you know, all these work in the same kind of bootstrapped, you know, environment. So namespace will work. But in order to pass things from closure to closure script, I had to create this. So I'm a big fan of like flow-based programming, you know? So when I take this block and I say, you know, drag this out here, uh, by default, it drags out itself. But it's not itself. It's basically just a reference to that previous block. And I'm literally using this like a pseudo uh, pseudo map here to say, hey, you know, look this up um, from mm -hmm. the incoming box. Um, but when this gets rendered, this this turns into a reframe subscription in the back end. So the user doesn't see it. As far as the user knows, this is just some arbitrary thing being passed in, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And it could even be like, let's say I have a, like a markdown box here, you know, um, and I drag this in so the markdown box and then i just say you know one two three uh param and then it just shows down here right so we go to like uh one two three right it's just text you know all it cares about is like i'm taking this thing in and i'm drawing it um so this is so this is um right my, my recollection of closure <laughs> is that there's no like triple colon uh you know sigil so that's no. just something you're searching for and picking up in your kind of your pre-processing step or whatever and then you can replace that with whatever the actual input is. Is that, is that right? Yeah, because if I'm taking like like the other example where I'm spending those slider values to like the encanter closure REPL, like it has no way of knowing anything in that environment, right? So I basically have to like inject that uh, into the code, but I want to do it in a way to where it's not like completely like bizarre, right? Um, I mean, I think you can teach people enough that like, hey, like, so this params that in, uh, or even better, you can, it's, there's even a shorter one where it's just in. Um, is this incoming string from this block? I want to make each block as atomic as possible without losing kind of all that that kind of like flow uh, deal. Um, and uh, just one last thing, I can also say, you know, this block, let's say, you know, has three input parameters, right? And then I can do whatever I want, you know, with them. So if we hit here and then, oh, drag this guy in number two and, you know, now we have, oh, I should back this guy. Yeah. So now we have these two input values. You can just see how you can kind of chain stuff together uh, and make things work that way. Um, and it doesn't have to know anything, anything more than, you know, I, once this gets rendered, I'm replacing this with whatever the input value is, or actually the whole thing. So this is the income, this is a map in is the key and param 169 is the key. So anyways, that was a very long winded five minutes, but 10 minutes. <laughs> so so I'm wondering if anyone has questions specifically about, because it seems like the most relevant piece, like it's, it's really great to have all that context, but it seems like the most relevant piece for our discussion is just that 
that inference about like, okay, is this a row set or is this, uh, am I, you know, displaying this as kind of nested cards, um, map box, I think is what you called it. Um, does anyone have questions about that and how this, because that seems like the core of what we're talking about right now, right? Um, I mean, one question I had is that um, it seems like there's at least two different use cases. There's one use case where you're like, okay, I've got some data, show it to me. And if it's a little bit, you know, if there's some pixels misplaced, it doesn't really matter because I can still see the data and I can still work with it. And then there's another use case where you actually care about the output, where you're building a notebook and you want to send that to somebody externally, or you want to present that to somebody you work with and you want it to look a specific way and you care about misplaced pixels. And I think um, it's, it's kind of tough. Um, I mean, I think the first use case is very doable where you just kind of want to show something. Um, but when you care about um, misplaced pixels, it's, um, I think it could be difficult to find common ground across the different tools who have, you know, different paradigms for how to put the different visualizations together, like Portal and Oz and Data Rabbit. Um, so I don't know if um, the clay and tools are specifically just targeted at one of those use cases or if um, they're gonna, if they want to handle both, um, I don't yeah, know what people. It's tough, right? I mean, I so I don't follow like like you saw. I don't follow like a notebook type linear, you know, flow. Like I have objects where they're basically other. It's basically I think I showed a dashboard there real quick where it's basically here's all my objects, right? And then here's a, a an object, a composer view with all those things arranged pixel wise and formatted and put together. But it's not. It's not in the traditional notebook, you know, up and down flow. Uh, so it wouldn't map to much of anything probably, but, but yeah, I mean, that's the other side of it, right? Like we're creating stuff. We want to look at it. We want it to work, but we also want it to be uh, nice, right. And presentable. So, so is the, if I can understand your question, Adrian, I mean, it's kind of about like, uh, how much do we care about just like something that you can explore with versus something that you can kind of publish with. Right. Um, is that kind right. of a good summary? So, so it seems it's just, then like where you'd maybe publish with this is like, like this is kind of a composer tool and maybe you would publish like a specific block that like you said, maybe you'd have a bunch of different blocks that are generating different visualizations or content or whatever. And then you'd be sticking those into one final block that could almost be like your notebook or your, your document, your, you know, whatever. Is that, oh. is that like, is that part of your usage model or, um, I mean, I was um, considering this question in the um, kind of in the discussion that Daniel started. So across tools. So I think for any specific tool, okay. there's ways to kind of like for Oz, like I want it to look good in Oz. I can do that. I want it to look good in Portal. I want it to look good in Data Rabbit. Okay. Yeah. I think um, that's very doable. If you wanted some common ground and you're like, I want it to work and look good and all like making it look good in Portal and in Oz seems uh, I mean, with the tools available, seems very hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you could like Data Rabbit looks great. I think if you wanted to create a dashboard that looks great in Data Rabbit, and you wanted to present that to your coworkers or to an external uh, vendor or something, you could make that look great. But also copy and paste in that and have that also um, have some of those same things show up and look great in. Oz, I think would be like having the common ground there, I think is very difficult. No, agreed. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying, right? Because you're dealing with different like default stylings of whatever divs and whatever else, right? So it's like, so my, I'm interested in hearing Daniel's perspective on this actually, or anyone's, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but um, so please, you know, <laughs> shut me up if you need to. Um, but I, it seems like, um, the level of what we're talking about is not necessarily uh, ever like we want a way for like everything to look good everywhere. It's more just that like the 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 way that we would put things together almost right, and the way that we would um, oh god um, right like if if let's okay so let maybe this is a good uh, motivating example. 
let's say someone has um, a library that I don't know. It's like it's like an analysis library, right? Like maybe it's doing work uh, like NLP or something. And one of the things that it can do is spit out a visualization of like some of the topics that came up as like a word cloud or something. Just you know whatever, right? Just just motivating example. Um, so that's something that you know different tools. Sure, if you're going to put it in portal or if you're going to put it in data rabbit or Oz or whatever, you might want to style it differently because you might have a different kind of document or dashboard or you're expecting different things. And that's, that seems to me to be fine. Um, but that maybe most of where you'd, um, well, it, yeah, I mean, it seems like maybe most of where you'd customize that will be kind of outside of the context of like, here's the, the Vega thing that you're going to be rendering. Right. Um, and that really the challenge for us is to say like, how do we even recognize that this is a Vega thing? And when you see code that's that's generating that Vega thing, well, okay, so actually there's there's kind of two components to this, right? Because one is that library author, um, in theory, could again, as as um, as Daniel was suggesting, attach metadata that says this is of kind Vega or Vega Light, whatever. Um, and then you know our tools can pick up on that and say, okay, like I know what to do with that now. Um, is, I mean, I think that's the level of what we're talking about, right? And so like how much, I mean, it, you're right that I think, you know, if you're, if you're getting into fine tuning that big visualization for one environment versus another, um, like that's just where the idea of having, you know, um, that library author being able to anticipate all those changes, like, that seems to be the barrier, right? Like we're, you know, there's there that library out there is not going to go through all the work to like, <laughs> there's not even going to be a way probably to go through all the work of figuring out like which environment are you on or which kind of, I mean, maybe you could support themes or something like that, but like, um, yeah, I'm kind of rambling a little bit here, but like that, that seems to me, that seems like a fine trade-off. Um, what do others feel about like that as kind of an example? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good trade off, uh, but I do think um, you can that can inform what you're building. Like, if you want to, if you want to be, um, if you want to say, okay, this is not going to give you pixel perfect things across different things, you can build a different library than something that where you try to do that. So, like, if you wanted to make it more pixel perfect, you'd have to make more standardization across all the tools. You'd probably have to use something more general, like, okay, everybody's going to just like put in iframes everywhere. Um, and that would impose a lot of structure on the individual tools. But if you don't care as much, um, you can have all the tools like, okay, here's the 10 things that every, um, every tool can't, like every tool can have a visualization for text, tables, Vega, hiccup, um, and then when it, you know, if it gets inserted, it might kind of look funky and have different, you know, if you have a header H2, it's going to like give you different fonts and the different tools, but you got to be okay with that. Um, yeah. 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 It, it looks like we are kind of talking about more or less the same thing. And that, that in itself is, uh, you know, some, something I'm so happy about. And yeah, and I really like this last description of what it is that you said, right, Adrian. And uh, uh, so maybe maybe let us imagine really a concrete path that could possibly be easy, like an experiment. So possibly we come up with this tiny library. Maybe it will be called kindly as I'm trying, or maybe some other name that has one entry point called advice. And and then, you know, we will try with one tool, maybe Oz, to use that. And here is how it could work. So whenever Oz is deciding to render a value, it would call the function kindly advice and see if it returns anything, any specific kind, and it would just respect that advice. If it is not returning anything, it would just behave as usual. And then if that is working in Oz, 
then we could behind the scenes play with different defaults of the advice behavior and see the resulting OS notebooks. And so what I just described is possibly an easy experiment that would teach us about this possibility. And then if we like it, we could just start creating tutorials and see if they render nicely in OS, for example. And what do you think about this path? Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds great to me. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that, I think that one of the main questions for us right now is to what extent will, because um, really what we're, yeah, so we're talking about kindly here, basically, right? And, and really asking ourselves the question, like, can we make it do the kind of inference um, or, or uh, you know, be the, the descriptive layer for all of these different projects. Um, I think that's a fair summary, right? So from my perspective, it seemed like things seem pretty positive so far because, you know, I'm, I'm looking at what you're presenting, Ryan, and everything's like, I mean, it's the same kind of in a way, like, I think you're maybe going into things a little more deeply than I have been, but, um, but that also kind of covers territory that I want to be able to cover. Like, I would, I would like for um, one of the things that, and this has been a little bit motivating talking with Daniel, um, one of the things that I would like to do is um, move away from the current model in Oz, which is that to display anything, you need to use a hiccup form. And so my, my assumption has always been, at, well, until now that I'm kind of reevaluating it has always been that like, you're going to decide how you want to display things, right? Um, you know, if you want to display something as Vega light, you say Vega light and then plop the data in. If you want to display uh, a div with some content in it, then like you plop that in, right? Um, and that, um, and that if you just have some chunk of code that's returning data, um, it's not actually going to do anything with that, right? Like it's only going to do stuff. It's only going to render anything that looks like it's hiccup, you know, that's like a literal vector form. Um, and, you know, like either the first thing is keyword or, you know, or, or function or whatever. Um, so, you know, if you want to move to part, part of what was, and I gave Daniel credit for, the, for this, but I think that also, um, you know, one of my reasons for going this route was because I was thinking about what's, what's going to happen if someone like Jen, you know, calls map uh, ink on just range, right? You're going to get an infinite sequence of stuff and it's going to break your computer um, or at least the process. Right. And so I saw that and I was like, eh, yeah, I want people to opt into displaying things. I don't want, I don't want people getting surprised by, um, by things breaking, breaking their process. Um, but clerk went and did a really lovely, and I feel like it's one of the, one of the, um, uh, most, um, one of the most profound innovations of Clerk was that it really did the work to say like, okay, if we have something like that, we're going to actually stream it into the browser. And that's brilliant because now it, it like kind of solves that problem. And now you can say like, oh yeah, let's just, re let's just render every value. That's great. I mean, that's, that's really nice from a workbook flow. There's, we've had previous discussions here about like, what's ideal for like an explorative workbook, notebook kind of thing versus like something that you actually want to turn into a document. And part of where, you know, Oz's philosophy is a little bit different is that I've always been really focused on like producing nice, at least nice, just hopefully uh, documents. Um, because that just, that, that's kind of one of the things that I do work-wise. Like I'm not always making notebooks for other data scientists or tech people, but often I'm making them for people who are non-technical. And so they don't, they don't care about the code. They don't care about seeing every value that I'm computing in between. They just want to see the visualizations and the, you know, maybe I'm, spinning out some values um, uh, here and there just to, you know, result of this calculation, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, that's kind of, I feel like useful background, but I think that enough, it, it's, it's an appealing enough mode and enough people I think would want to use like the notebook kind of environment in that mode. Um, Cause not everyone is, 
making those kind of publications, right? I mean, not everyone's focused on that as like the output. Um, and I want Oz to be really flexible so people can kind of use it however they like. And like the, <laughs> as soon as I saw Clerk, I started realizing in my own work, it's like, oh yeah, every time I want to see something, I have to like add another tag to actually see it, right? And like, that's actually kind of annoying. Um, so, so yeah, I think that a mode where it's doing some kind of automatic inference, where it's doing an advise basically to say like, all right, what kind of thing is this? Is this a row set? Maybe I'll render that as a table. Um, is this a, uh, uh, is this some weird nested card thing? Um, maybe I'll just print it out or maybe I'll, yeah, do, do, do your kind of map box thing. Um, those, it seems to me like, and, and I haven't gotten deep into this inference side of things yet. So like, this is, this is a good time to be talking about it. Um, but it seems to me like we're kind of thinking about things from the same angles, right? Like we've got, we've got some different kinds of shape of data coming in and um, like, it, it seems to me like we're not in so such totally different worlds that we wouldn't be able to settle on some set of kinds, if you will, um, that that let us kind of have a shared vocabulary for like what it is, how we want to display something. What are, um, sorry, I'm getting a ring. Uh, what are your, uh, is everyone else getting the same impression or um, or do we, are we kind of seeing things uh, differently? I think so. I mean, if you were to draw a Venn diagram of all these tools, right, there's definitely that middle where they're all yeah. trying to do the same kind of thing. Um, yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of like presentation versus like, I don't know what you'd call like literate programming. You know what I mean? Like how things are put together versus like, I mean, in my day job, I build dashboards, right? So my users don't give a yeah. shit how it was built. Right. They just want to say, what is the answer? Right. Um, yeah. But, you know, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was like, okay, well, I, I want to understand like the spaghetti behind the answer too, right? How do I balance those two things? Um, and I think notebooks like do a pretty decent job of that. Um, but but yeah, to your point, I think there's a lot of commonality with all these things. It's just everyone approach it in a different, you know, from a different angle. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's funny because we all have like very different tools as far as like how you'd use them uh, sort of, right? But like we all have this very similar problem of like, what do we do with different shape data? Yeah. Um, so yep. uh, uh, how about you, Adrian? What's your, what's your perspective on like, if we just kind of restrict, forget about like presentation and stuff and just restrict ourselves to like, what kind of thing in this and how would we, like what, what pathway would we take to render it? Um, do you feel like from what you saw with Ryan's work with Data Rabbit, like that, you know, the different, obviously <laughs> I feel like we all have different names for these kind of like this kind of data, but like, row set, uh, you know, nested maps. Um, I mean, do you see like the same kind of pattern there about like the sorts of things you'd want to be able to describe or anticipate any kind of conflict? No, I mean, I think that sounds great. I think, um, yeah, cool. Yeah. I mean, I think there's um, a handful of things that are already kind of supported widely. And yeah. uh, if you just kind of give names to them, then each tool can say like, okay, I've got a list of, I've got an image, I've got some Vega, I've got some hiccup. I've got a um, data, I've got a string. I know how to render all those and I can decide how to do that. Um, and I like that a lot. Um, I mean, I've been doing stuff on the closure side. So I have my own like desktop UI library and a lot of the tools and um, focus has kind of focused on the stuff getting it to show up in the browser. But if, you know, just like Markdown where you have like, I have a heading, I have a paragraph, I have an image, I have a yeah. link. Um, I can display all that um, without HTML. I can just use um, right. my own graphics library. So I'm very interested in, you know, if we have this, you know, here's a big closure namespace, and then you use kindly to spit out a list of um, images, text, paragraphs, vega plots, or whatever, then, then I can use that for me doing desktop stuff, which is great. And I like that kind of data oriented approach. So I think I think that would be great. I'd be happy if uh, that was available. I'd, I definitely want to play around with that. Yeah, cool. So, if if I may, like some of the things that come to mind as potential points of conflict. Um, one is like, what do you do? Like, if we're if we're sniffing out a row map looking thing, or that we think might be a row map looking thing, but there's like a lot of elements in it. Like, is that is that going to be a problem? Just like the kind of performance hit of like having big data structures that we're passing around and we're like doing a bunch of work to figure out like what kind of thing is this? 
Uh, like what's your, have you encountered any issues with that at, at this point, Ryan? Yeah, because I mean, I, I um, yeah, okay. at, the end, at the end of the day, I'm dealing with a browser, right? Which has a very low yeah. threshold. Yeah, 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 <laughs> very, yeah. Very low yeah. threshold for that kind of stuff. So I'm almost uh, jealous of Adrian doing stuff in the desktop UI where <laughs> you can use the horsepower of the computer, right? Instead of like, yeah. oh, please, Google Chrome, don't crash on me, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough, right? I mean, that's that's one of the big problems with using CLJS as a render layer. You know, I can, yeah. like, um. I would love to have a better way to have readers that can, I like your clerk example, right? Stream stuff from like ML data set or something, as opposed to like, yeah, I can send it all to the browser and then I can have React virtualize it, which helps, but it still is like nowhere near as good as you'd want for like, like yeah, my yeah. desktop SQL tool, right? Can can right. show infinitely more rows than the browser can. So it's kind of like, it's it's tough. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, in, terms, in terms of like detecting the data type, like, yeah, I just sample a little bit and it can be wrong sometimes. It's just, you know, I'm just trying yeah. to like, that's like, that's like my version of the advice function, right? And like, what is this? Yeah. Okay, cool. Render it this way, you know? So uh, I'll, this is maybe a little bit of a sidetrack because it's more about implementation details, but like um, I've done some experiments with like um, either like lazy rendering of table rows or, um, or what do they call it? There's like, I don't know, there, there's some tricks you can use where you're not actually rendering like every row at once. Cause like, that's where you end up getting into big. Yeah. But well, at least the worst performance problems with like, uh, with JS and CLJS stuff is right. Where you just have like way too many components. And if yeah. you can make it look like you're scrolling through a block but actually it's only ever rendering, you know a handful of components at once that can, that can make a big difference. Yeah. I mean, um, I, do, I do some of that with my, my table okay, grid. Cool. Yeah. But, but the problem yeah. I, I ran into is that in my, my, I still have to have all that data in the browser. Yeah, yeah. you're running up on the data problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that kind yeah, of like I, I hear you. I hear yeah, because before yeah. before I implemented that that kind of like lazy loading thing, like it yeah. it would barely work. It you would, get like 200 rows yeah. there, and you're yeah. effed. Yeah, right? yeah, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> death, instant death. I, I I'm I'm with you there. Uh, yeah, cool, cool. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page there about yeah, yeah. Uh, what we were talking about. But um, yeah. So so yeah, obviously that's a challenge, and you know, we just have to, but. I feel like if if the inference is happening mostly on the closure side, I mean that's at least like if we all anticipate that at least like that's um, uh, and I don't know I mean maybe that's not the case but um, uh, it seems like there at least we're <laughs> we don't have to worry quite as much quite as much about that. Um, the, the um, other thing I'll, maybe so the other uh, maybe uh, uh, Christopher I'll stop you for a moment. We have uh, yeah. se seven minutes to the official time. And maybe a few of us will need to leave in a few moments. And so maybe let us try to conclude uh, if we could. And uh, yeah, so didn't want to stop you. Just we, we might not be able to dive into everything at the yeah. moment. Yeah, totally. Um, so I, the, I guess the last thing then for me is just kind of encourage to think about where there might be sticky points in, um, in how we interpret things or what we mean when we say something so in particular and this is just this is in some ways kind of a toy example you can kind of think about how you might work through it but um but it you know it does raise questions like so my in, in oz um if you're using kind of in a notebook flow um then when it sees any vector literal it assumes it's hiccup right so what that means is if you're trying to display like a vector that has some things in it, like I think Daniel, you showed maybe it was um, it was a vector with three visualizations in it, and it showed it as like you know each visualization in a row or in a column or whatever. So like that's a really cool example, but it's um, but it's one where we're kind of interpreting things differently. And so I mean, right now I mean maybe Oz would just say like, well, that's not valid hiccup anyway, so maybe we should just do what you know what Ryan's doing and say like, well, we look at the first element and see if you know it's a, it's either a keyword or a function and then decide like okay is this actually hiccup or should we treat it as just some other data structure like how do we well, what do we want to do with this um, well, maybe maybe i'll suggest a way to think about it in a moment yeah sure yeah i mean so I, I mean i'm basically done here i'm just saying like i feel like this is this is maybe where the meaty part of the discussion is right now is like where are our interpretations of things going to potentially um, run into each other yeah so so maybe Maybe a brief comment is that um, at the moment, what we are talking about mostly is 
a tiny protocol we could hopefully agree about. And then afterwards, we could keep working on inference, on, on the advice engine, let us call it. And then you could imagine having different advice modes. So one of them could be, could just reproduce the current way ours work. Mm -hmm. Another one could be somebody saying, I wish to be safe. I don't want to run into big values. I will just print everything as markdown and uh, use some printing uh, cap so that I wouldn't print uh, any, any too, anything too much. And that is my mode. That is how I render my blog post. That is the advice I would give any tool. And then it would be renderable in OZ if OZ respects the advice, right? Mm -hmm. So we could imagine writing tutorials with given advice semantics and be, being uh, compatible with future uh, adventures of better inference just because we were concrete about our mode of advice. Th does it make sense? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's the right idea for sure. Um, I'm trying to imagine though, like, because again, our motivating example is like, we want people to be able to take something from like workshop that's done with clay and reuse that code. So are you suggesting then, um, yeah, I mean, do we just hit up on that, that barrier then? Like Oz has kind of set things up so that the way it's using kindly, like it's gonna do certain things. If it does that, I mean, maybe it's not gonna do the same thing you expect when you pull code over from one uh, you know, code example online to, to a different environment. Right. Um, and, and maybe that's just, maybe that's just the price we paid that like that, that kind of interoperability, interoperability is never going to be perfect to the extent that, you know, our ideas about things are a little bit different, but, um, um, yeah, but I guess that's kind of the question, right? Like, are, are we going to get close enough to like a sweet spot where we feel like everyone kind of gets what they want or at least close enough, you know? Um, yeah, one thing just uh, that I'd like to mention for the advice protocol or whatever it ends up becoming is uh, if it can, instead of saying, give it a value or some code, uh, this is what I want to visualize, instead of returning kind of an ordered list of things. So it's like, I can get back a list of like, oh, here's a tree map. Okay, I don't know how to do a tree map, but I know how to do, mm. it's like, this could be a tree map or the next preference is, you know, a list of maps or something and the next thing is just text. And so at the end, you can kind of bottom out the text, but like as a tool, you can kind of, um, you know, you there's some things that you can implement and if you don't have all of them implemented and you get back something that you don't recognize, you can kind of fall back and it can kind of, um, you can have more kind of like the way they do fonts in the browsers. Uh, and this also provides a way for tools to say like, okay, I have a namespace keyword for membrane that's a very specific thing. It's only going to, membrane is probably the only thing that's going to be able to visualize this. But since it's an order list, I can have it fall back to a more generic thing that is kind of more widely implemented. Yeah, that seems potentially useful. Um, oh, okay, so and yeah, I'd also, ahead. yeah, and I'd also uh, like to advocate for, if not, requiring that the advice function run in constant time at, at least um, kind of having some advice function that you know will run in constant time. So it's like, if you get a la infinite lazy sequence, um, there's at least some version that is not gonna um, run forever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean. So what I what I did in semantic CSV for um, uh, it, it had kind of like an inference mode where you could guess what types of um, data cells in a you know in a CSV were, and what I did there was just to set kind of like uh, a number of rows that you sort of sniff through um, before deciding like okay like this looks good or not. And so I mean it's simple, but like I mean maybe something like that where we just cap it at you know hundred or. 200,000, well, you, you know, what, whatever it might be. Um, but that, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. I, I think you're right. We need, we need something that's going to be, that we can kind of predict what's, what's going to happen when we're, when we're shoving stuff around.
So just a quick question, Chris, like, are we thinking about uh, in terms of like Oz and, and Vega, are we, are we thinking of like treating those data structures almost as their own data type, right? And eschewing the idea of it's a wrapper under a render. It's like, here's my Vega light spec, right? And it will be understood as a Vega light spec using Oz, right? And be rendered that way, like without the machinery, you know what I mean? Is that is that kind of the direction we're thinking here? Or is it more, um, I don't know if I explained that right. Do you know what I mean? I, I think so. Let me I'll try to answer and then you can tell if, I, if I'm off, off base here. But um, so I think part, again, the, the way I think about this is from the perspective of like someone writing their NLP library and they have a function which returns some, some, um, uh, some Vega light uh, representing some aspect of the analysis, right? Um, presumably what that function would actually return is just literally like the map that you would stick into oz.core slash vega light, right? As a, as a closure script component. Um, so, uh, so almost like ve is, vega light hiccup, right? I mean, essentially. Wait, sorry, say it again? Almost like vega light hiccup, right? It's just this universal data structure that we all understand renders this thing, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And, and the problem there is like, it's going to be really hard to look at some random map, quote unquote, and figure out like, is this a vega light data structure? I mean, probably the best way to do that would be to like, I mean, so the Vega light and Vega have, um, have a JSON spec. So you could in theory, like, um, you know, dig in, pull out the JSON spec. I, I think that there are closure or, uh, or Java even, um, as a fallback, um, libraries for kind of interpreting JSON specs. Um, and then you use that to say like, all right, does this thing match the spec or not? I don't know how computationally intensive that is, uh, if we're going to run into the kind of the constant time issue problem there. Um, but, uh, you know, so, I mean, maybe we look into that, see if it seems reasonable enough kind of performance and logistics wise. Um, uh, there's going to be some challenges there with like, which version are you looking at, right? So the specs can be versioned or changed over time, but um, so that's a little bit of a trick. So if we put that aside for a second and just say like, all right, Again, if we're imagining that this is a library author and they just have a function that's returning this map, the, the, the question is really like, can you attach something to that map, say as metadata, that says like, this is Vega light, so that you don't even have to think about it. So that now Oz or, or, or Data Rabbit or Portal can just say like, oh, I know what this thing is. When I call this function, um, I'm not just going to render this as like random code or as a map. I'm going to render it as a Vega visualization because I know that's what it is. Because it, it, you know, the function that gave me this data attached metadata that says this is Vega light. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. I was thinking kind of like where I have the differentiation between a vector and hiccup, right? It would be like a vector, hiccup, Vega light vector, right? And then it gets rendered, however. Um, yeah. Cool. Just clarifying. Yeah, I would imagine the spec for Vega is massive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Vega light's probably not quite as bad, but Vega is pretty, pretty massive, I think, yeah. um, because it's just so composable. So I mean, yeah, I've seen really big Vega visualizations. Like someone actually built someone, <laughs> someone actually built Pac-Man in Vega, which is just, <laughs> just bonkers, ridiculous. But um, but I mean, it it just shows how sophisticated it is, like the data flow model. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Good luck, good luck specking that. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can do some heuristics, but you're just not going to catch everything. Um, so, yeah. Where's Daniel back? It's running down the street. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, moving uh, to have like uh, in like in twenty minutes we'll have a community session of this. Uh, probabilistic modeling study group where, by the way, everybody's invited. And so I'm moving to another location where I'll be joining there. Nice. So forgive my ignorance, but just as a consumer, I am not a producer of libraries, but as a consumer, just so I make sure I understand, the idea is that for me, would be that my coworker designed something, let's say using Data Rabbit, and I'm assuming they save it, and then I say, hey, you know, but I'm an exclusive user of Clerk, 
So they, these types, whether it's kindly, whatever, somewhere in that, it'll say, okay, you're going to display this in clerk and this is going to be Vega light. And there's, there's going to be something, some library explicitly wrapping whatever they wrote that says, he, I guess he or she is going to have to write in, you know, within their code. Okay. This is so because I want to make this work because, because I want to make this usable by outside of just my tool, I'm going to, is the user going to type in all that? Like if we use kindly, is the user going to type in these are the kinds or there's going to be some magical export function that sort of wraps all that stuff, if that makes any sense. Am I making any sense in my, my question? So someone else once said, sorry, I think, I think it depends a little bit on context. Like if you're using, um, if you're using like a library function, again, like I'm using this NLP library function example, if you're using that library function in theory, then yes, um, no matter which tool you move it around in, it should, it should pick up on that metadata that's been attached and say like, okay, this is a big, I don't know what to do with that. As long as the tool handles that. Um, if on the other hand, your coworker as you're describing is building a visualization um, in one of these tools um, and then you're wanting to copy that code and put it in another one, I think the answer is also yes, I, kind of with some with some caveats, right? So like some of our, like, uh, for example, if you're writing something in Oz, um, that's like a vector form, you might, you know, to do like right now to do a Vega light form in like an Oz notebook, you would do, um, uh, you know, vector uh, Vega light, and then your data spec, right? Um, and so it'd be kind of a hiccup looking form, but it's not like real hiccup, right? Cause it's not like Vega lights, not an actual HTML tag. So that's something that if you copy that into a different tool, it's probably not going to do the right thing. Cause that's like, that's how I decided I'm going to, you know, you know, I, I, that I was going to do things and you can key off and customize how different tags are rendered and stuff, but in Oz, but, um, but that's not necessarily going to be a thing everywhere. So like, I think the answer is like, if everyone is kind of sticking to the same, um, Yes. So if your coworker is writing in a particular style, then in theory, it would, it would be interoperable. So if, you know, Daniel gave this example where he had a, he had a map that's a Vega light map and then showed how either you could wrap that in a function that attaches some, you know, this is kind uh, Vega light, or you just attach metadata to it directly, which actually I kind of like because you're not having to like indent the code and like apply a function. You're kind of just like attaching something um, it's really nice because you can comment on or off that that metadata annotation um, pretty easily. Um, but kind of regardless of those details, the point then is like when we write or when your coworker writes in, in that kind of flavor, that mode, that's the piece that would be interoperable and you could move um, uh, wh wherever you want. Or at least, yeah. you know, that's the goal. So we would have to agree ahead of time that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna use kind. Let's say since we're talking about kind, we're gonna use, that's gonna be our, yeah. our 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 language or our protocol of choice. We're gonna make sure we rewrite such that we can interrupt because we're gonna choose to do this. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, to some extent, right? This is this is kind of that's why there's a lot of tool builders here because um, we're, we're having to sort of sign on and say like, all right, is this like, is this is this something we can all kind of do and live with? Because um, I mean. You know, when you're building a tool, if you don't have to think about anything else, like it's a lot easier, right? Um, you can kind of just architect everything to work the way that you want it. But the more we have to like think about, okay, well, how are other tools going to handle this and making sure that everything works? Um, it's just a little bit trickier. So, yeah. Um, that's also, like getting, if, we, getting... if we if we solve some of this stuff together, right, it'll be less bull in the ocean. Uh, yeah. You know. Right. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> that's true. I mean. <laughs> Uh, it's it's better to have one well thought out solution that kind of works for everyone than um, than a bunch of yeah. solutions that maybe didn't think about this edge case or that. So um, I think yeah. each of our products hopefully will be better as a result. But also, um, but you know, I, I really care about the interoperability and um, you know beginner friendliness kind of side of this. Like I, I really think that um, we stand a lot to gain if um, if it's. I mean, it's just so cool that we have so many tools to be doing visualization and uh, and data exploration and everything. Um, but uh, but yeah, folks are having a hard time navigating when they um, when they come into the space as beginners, especially. Um, that'll be frustrating, and just and just in general, you know, sometimes you want to use one tool for one thing and another for some other kind of some something else, right? 
Um, yep. So like I'm, I, I see myself probably playing with uh, with Data Rabbit at some point, I and mean, it's like pretty cool. Like I'm sure I can get some new closure converts that way. Um, so yeah, I mean to the extent that then when I move around, I'm able to use the same kind of idioms and, sh and reuse code more easily. Like that's that all to me feels like really positive. Yeah, less, yeah, I, less I, siloing. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking, I guess my use case was maybe similar, but just sort of thinking, okay, you know, I'm, let's say I'm going to teach something to some kids. I'm going to, I'm going to probably use Data Rabbit because it's so cool and fun. But then I thought like, if there was some magical export button, export as kindly.eden, uh, and then I can import it into some other tool and it'll just figure stuff out. Uh, then I can just show my coworkers. That's, that's how I was thinking. I wasn't thinking I could just take it as is. I was thinking, okay, there's going to be some magic plugin that does exports it into a kindly format. I don't know, just like, so like, just like Google Docs and Excel, like you're going to just export this thing and then boom, it's going to, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to work enough for me to say, okay, I can use in 2X. Yeah, that will be super cool. Hey, and folks. vice versa, right? You have something in one of the notebook tools and you import that into Rabbit and it's, you know, shows all the blocks and I mean, that'd be dope. Hey folks, John here. Stepping to say hi. Hey John. Yeah. Happy Friday. I, I, is this the tail end of the meeting? Uh, yeah, yeah, sort of. I figured I kind of missed most of it. But um, I do have something I could show y'all. Because um, I've been playing around with uh, Bork Dude's Psy interpreter and stuff. And uh, then I, I caught on to Daniel's Clay. Uh, and the kindly stuff, and I'm really excited about that. So I threw some stuff together, and I can show it to y'all if you want to see it real quick. You interested in seeing it? Let me share my Go screen. For it. All right. I gotta say yes to this. Um, allow screen sharing. I'm gonna say Google Chrome because I think. So do y'all see this browser with three windows in it? Do y'all see my whole screen? Do you see anything? Uh, no, I actually, anything. no screen sharing yet. Oh, so let me try this again. Hold on. Uh, well, I'll be right back. Let me try This meeting is being recorded. All right, I'm back. Let me try this again. I'd like to share out the whole screen. Entire screen. Let me try that. Allow. How about now? Do you see my screen now? Yep, we yeah. got you now. Yeah, yeah, this is this cool little thing, and this is just a um, sigh, and I took the Monaco editor right the uh, it's what's built into vs code it's a web component and so that's it right here and um here's just a folder structure actually um we have a different screen we've got the um we've got yes. your firefox browser screen right now um okay let me oh well that's that that's what i i'm are you seeing yourselves? I yes. am seeing myself, yes. Okay, let me get this <laughs> All right, can you see this three, these three boxes? No. You're still seeing yourself. It seems like you're Holy maybe God. sharing just that one window instead of the whole um, screen. Yep, and I told it to, to share the whole screen. Hmm. Hold on, I'm gonna come back to this from uh, Chrome instead of Firefox. Be right back, y'all. A heads up, Christopher. I'm totally going to bother you next week about um, like on a click actions and signals. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah sounds I mean, good. this is it's it's um, it's really nice to have some motivating, um, uh, 
yeah, motivating use cases to kind of think through. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely bug me. Let me know um, like which of those you think would be most useful and um, maybe we can team up and, and um, do some work on them. Cool. Yeah, I was blown away with the whole layer thing. I was like, wow, that's because uh, it's much lighter weight than me re-rendering a whole new thing, right? And composing them manually. So it's dope. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. How we doing now, y'all? Yeah, now we got yeah, you. Yeah, we're saying Okay, so. cool. So reload this. So this is this thing, and it's um, on the left side, you have just uh, a directory structure that's basically just a source files and a map. Then you have this editor, which is built with Monaco, and it actually has, no, there's a, there's a way to bring up the uh, palette. You know, if you could command palette, with it. pretty cool. But the idea here, this is the editor view, but imagine this view on the right, this is your web page. And what I want to build with this thing is a little static blog engine thing where instead of, where you can build a static website and a static blog without having to use the CLI. And you can basically, just like fork a repo or maybe I'm thinking about various backends for where the data lives, but the essentially the idea is you just code it in the browser, you hit commit and then it saves your stuff and then people can view it like your blog. And uh, this is the view on the right of your blog. And if you click and hold on a given element, it brings up the, um, the code for it. If you're not in this mode where you see the stuff on the left. So you could just edit, uh, your blog within your blog just by hovering and clicking if you're in if you're logged in and then and in an admin mode you can just click on an element and it brings up the editor for that component and then you can build sub components within that by doing like div high code and then some path into uh what you what, what you want to add cljs say say and then control s oh man didn't work hi the, the yeah, curse, well, uh, the, curse the demo <laughs> yeah i know man so if i if i do that then you see hi pops up there h1 let's see if it works over here if i do code root stuff cljs Oh man, what's why is it doing that? What are we? Ah, uh, I don't know why it's not working suddenly all of a sudden. Is this Chrome? This is Chrome. Ah, oh, it's a bummer because. But what you maybe might work is if I do co code uh, root to do app CLJS, which is already kind of in the source directory now. Let me see what, let me just see real quick what the error says. Love the uh, live coding stuff though. I'm a big fan. Yeah. Of yeah. Well, bottom line, the point is, ah, oh, man, it, it's because it's probably, I've messed up the directory structure here. This, this directory structure and how it maps to where files live in the, in the, uh, the atom, but, uh, Anyway, the idea here is code, you put some stuff in here like root uh, to do C, uh, app CLJS, right, for instance, and I'm not gonna evaluate that, but then over here, you could put in div high and that'll show up as a subcomponent within the root, which is right here, root CLJS. So uh, you can compose in the browser um basically all your your stuff let me save this that's saved and now now i have to i have to do this little presentation again one time once it's working it was just working earlier y'all i swear to I swear to goodness so is i have a quick question is the the way that this is supposed to work is it um is it that it just renders like the last hiccup form or do you render each hiccup form kind of in turn in a big div um in form it's like hiccup inception it's like it's like a uh, sigh <laughs> inception all right so like each code thing creates a new sigh evaluation 
but they're all sharing the same evaluation context. Yeah, no, so, I, I get that. But so as far as like, what's gonna, so if you type H1, you know, hello, and then another tag um, below it, that's like, um, you know, P world. Like this, you mean? Yeah, right. Are those both gonna render or just the, the last one, the P world? No, only the, only the last one. And that's just, just how okay, I have it, it right now. Yeah, yeah, okay, got it. Uh, yeah, and so if you want if you want more stuff, you just have to do the layout yourself, yeah. Especially the last thing you return though, which I think is kind of yeah. convenient because then you can, you can go ahead and, ahead and make functions up here that apply to right. down here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is actually how Oz used to work. It used to be that it would only render the last thing in a code file. And so for, um, which, yeah, at the time I thought was the right thing to do, but I realized that if you want to use it as a notebook, it's actually really problematic because you don't want, um, you don't want to have to re-render the whole like page anytime you change something, right? And so for me, I realized that if you want to use Oz as a notebook, it's actually really, really helpful to be able to inline comments, inline code, and just each time you change something, it's, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't have to re-render everything. I mean, some of the, some of that's some additional work figuring out the dependencies between things. So like that's that's kind of a whole separate thing. But even just from the perspective of like, you know, just starting to re-render or reevaluate from the first line that changed was kind of the initial thing that Oz did. Um, and, and and even just uh, even just at that kind of stage, being able to break it up into multiple tags um, has some advantages. For well, your, what for I was your use case, was... that may not matter at all though, because you're you're focused on building static sites. Um, you're maybe not as interested in like, you know, big data stuff where like, you don't want to have to recompute things because it's, hey, it might take 10 minutes, right? Um, well, what, so, what was, you know. for that purpose, uh, what I was thinking of doing was having a, you know, like a glorified uh, markdown document version where if you're, if you're doing a markdown thing, right. then like it would be more like that, that flow where yeah. everything gets rendered but then you, it, you can go back to just editing a CLJS file and you get all the, it just acts like a CLJS file. And, and you can actually require from other files within this directory structure. And so they behave like how you expect in the IDE. But then I think for the, the markdown or maybe some more like markdown on steroids kind of thing that allows you to put kindly uh, clay stuff in there, uh, I think would be really neat. Yeah, I, I like the idea of calling other files with just like that code function. So you can have like one file that's literally just the div structure, right? And all the logic and stuff you run is in all the other, uh, keeps, keeps it nice and clean, right? With the presentation and the uh, computation and stuff. I really uh, wish it freaking worked. I, I, sorry, I'll stop you for a moment. John, so nice to meet again. It's, hey. You know, really amazing surprise to have this demo at the end. Uh, we will have to stop in about three minutes because there is another community session and they would need the Zoom account, I think. So uh, maybe uh, it is time for kind of last comments for anybody if uh, there is any conclusion. And uh, John, maybe you would like to present that next week uh, briefly. Uh, there is a session dedicated to data. Yeah, once it's working next week. And Daniel, uh, you kind of cut off there, but I'd love to talk to you about clay too and, and get that integrated into this because I, that's one of the reasons I built this because I was pretty excited about clay. Yeah, great, great. And so anyway, uh, let us chat. And uh, so if there is any concluding comment by anybody, it is good time. And then in a moment, we'll have to end. And uh, thank you really, uh, such a great meeting. Thank you so much, everybody. Yep, thanks everyone, so productive. Cheers guys, have a good weekend. Cool, see y'all.